Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, I want to talk about a heartbreaking tragedy that recently occurred about an hour away from me in North Carolina. On August 20th, a devastating hit and run accident claimed the life of Daniela Trejo Mendiola, a bright 17 year old. My heartfelt condolences go out to Daniela's family as they navigate this senseless loss. Our local news has been closely following this case, but unfortunately, it's been marred by misinformation on social media. Some have turned this tragedy into a racial issue while others suggest that the driver, Joshua Brown, wasn't arrested because his father is in law enforcement. Recently, I noticed that Olivia and Betty have joined the protests surrounding this case. It's worth mentioning that Olivia and Betty have a reputation for sensationalizing cases, which adds another layer of complexity to the situation. In a poignant video dated September 7, 2024, Olivia interviews a neighbor who witnessed the aftermath of the accident. Let's listen to what she had to say. And I did not recognize her. So then I walked back over and I was like, so what happened? And Joshua said, I hit her. I thought it was a deer. She was in the middle of the road. Now his eyes were bloodshot. He was either drunk or had been drinking or he was high. He stayed in front of the vehicle, the other gentleman on the side. And that was all he said. Other than when you're here, I would tell my story over and over again because I was here before the EMTs, fire, police, anybody. He was like quiet. He didn't have like a demeanor. He was just like silent. Like it's almost like someone had told him, you know, just don't, don't speak. Don't speak, don't, don't give anything away. But I mean, he'd already gave it away that he had thought he had hit a deer and went home and came the fuck back. And I'm sorry for my language, but this is like a very angry subject and I cuss a lot anyway, so, but yeah. Like I've heard that he's related to somebody in a, part, in a department and stuff. I have a friend that works at a store up in Liberty that said that his dad was a, his dad was a sheriff for Randolph County. And I've also heard that he, his dad was a sheriff for something for, you know, Alamance or a trooper. So I'm like, well, I don't know who the hell he's related to, but he's gotta have some kind of damn pool somewhere. And that doesn't make it right. Quote, I came home and walked over to the car and spoke to Joshua Brown. He was drunk or high because his eyes were bloodshot. He kicked her cell phone out of the road. Daniela's boyfriend comes outside and asks both men which of them were driving the car. The men were Joshua and his dad. His mom was in the car. Joshua was quiet as if he had been told not to say anything. I have a friend who works at a store in Liberty, and she said that Joshua's dad works for Randolph County. I've also heard his dad was a sheriff of something, you know, Alamance or a trooper. So I don't know who the hell he's related to, but he's got to have some kind of damn pull somewhere. I saw court footage and they had him mixed up with some other guy. So, okay, if he doesn't have charges, how do we know they didn't get them expunged from his records? And he likes to go fast. We saw his TikToks, end quote. These are serious allegations and concerns raised by those who were there at the scene. While I'm not asserting the truth of these claims, it's important to consider all perspectives. Let me provide a bit more context. On the night of August 20th, Joshua was driving on Oak Grove Church Road near Garrett Road in Alamance County. Daniela was leaving her friend's house, waiting for another friend to pick her up. Joshua collided with her vehicle, initially thinking he had hit a deer. He then went to his parents' home nearby and realized the damage didn't match hitting a deer. He asked his parents to bring him back to the scene at which point he understood he had hit a person. A state trooper arrived after Joshua had already returned to the scene. The trooper believed Daniela was walking in the middle of the road when she was struck. Despite the circumstances, Joshua was allowed to leave the scene after being spoken to by the officer. Initially, the protest seemed justified. There were no charges filed against Joshua because he did return to the scene after realizing his mistake and waited for the police to arrive. However, the lack of charges has fueled further unrest and suspicion within the community, resulting in wanting more clarification, which they were owed. On September 5th, 2024, an article was released from Alamance News. Here is it. The slow moan of traffic in Court Square was briefly drowned out on Tuesday when a crush of demonstrators rallied on behalf of a teenager who was fatally struck by a motorist on the outskirts of Liberty two weeks ago. This pop-up protest raised quite a stir that afternoon with its demands of justice for Daniela Trejo Mendiola, whose death on August 20th had become a cause for many Latinos in Alamance County. Aside from their grief over the 17-year-old's untimely fate, the participants in Tuesday's demonstration were also exasperated by the lack of criminal charges, which at that point had met the 38-year-old driver who ended her life. Trejo supporters channeled their pent-up frustrations over this apparent miscarriage of justice into a boisterous chorus of lock him up that ricocheted across Court Square on Tuesday. The pleas of these protesters were apparently answered on Wednesday, 
when the NC Highway Patrol, which had previously been reticent to file criminal charges, formally lodged a felony charge against Josh Thomas Brown for his alleged role in Trejo's demise. According to an arrest warrant that the state agency filed that afternoon, the 38-year-old white male, who hails from 8963-B Pleasant Hill Church Road in Liberty, had failed to remain at the scene of the accident until he received the all-clear to do so from law enforcement. Although Brown did return ahead of the state trooper, who was sent to the site, his previous departure compelled the highway patrol to charge him with one count, a felony-level hit-and-run, resulting in serious injury and death. Later that day, the highway patrol issued a news release that credited newfound information for the agency's about-face on the decision to file criminal charges. The news release added that Brown voluntarily went to the county jail to turn himself in at 5 on p.m. on Wednesday and was charged with a window tint violation in addition to the aforementioned felony. According to the news release, Brown has been placed under a secured bond of $50,000. Brown's arrest for felony hit and run was still more than a day away when Trejo supporters were pounding the proverbial pavement on Tuesday afternoon. But even then, the wheels of justice seemed to have started to move for the deceased teenager and her well-wishers. Shortly after Tuesday's demonstration, Brian Martin, a state trooper with the NC Highway Patrol, told the Alamance News that his agency had just met with prosecutors about this case, which his agency had initially investigated without filing any charges against the driver. We just met with the DA's office at 2 p.m. today, he informed the newspaper that afternoon. After that meeting, everything we had, we turned over to the DA's office, and they'll determine whether to pursue charges. The Highway Patrol's aforementioned news release also alluded to this interagency confab, where the agency's Collision Reconstruction Unit reportedly presented the DA's office with the newfound information that resulted in Brown's arrest on Wednesday. Martin was quite frugal with details about the collision when he spoke to the newspaper's reporter on Tuesday. The state trooper acknowledged that his agency had initially received a call about the pedestrian fatality at 9.45 p.m. on Tuesday, August 20th. He also pinned down the site of the accident as Oak Grove Church Road, a state-maintained route in southern Alamance County. The Highway Patrol's subsequent warrant fills in many of the particulars that Martin had kept close to the vest during his conversation with the Alamance News. According to the text of the warrant, State Trooper A.J. Lynch reached the scene of the accident at about 10.10 p.m. to find Brown waiting there with a vehicle that wasn't involved in the collision. The narrative goes on to identify the original vehicle as a Volkswagen Stett passenger car, which had been heading north on Oak Grove Church Road when it struck a pedestrian. The Volkswagen passenger car then turned around and left the scene, the arrest warrant goes on to recount. Approximately 15 minutes later, the driver, Joshua Thomas Brown, arrived back at the scene in the passenger seat of a different vehicle. Once Trooper Lynch arrived on scene and questioned the driver, the warrant continues, Brown stated that he thought that he hit a deer. He then drove the vehicle to his parents' house, assessed the damages on the vehicle, and decided to get his parents to drive him back to the scene because the damage did not appear to be from a deer. The highway patrol had previously offered a somewhat sanitized account of this accident when it issued a news release in the immediate aftermath of the accident. According to this pithy communique, Trejo had been traveling as a pedestrian in the middle of the roadway when she collided with Brown's 2011 Volkswagen. The news release adds that Brown was unable to avoid the pedestrian, who died on scene, before it declares that Brown will not face charges for the collision. The state agency's subsequent accounts of the accident have confirmed some of the information that has been circulating in news outlets and on social media since Trejo's death. It also dispels some of apocryphal claims about the accident, including a rather persistent canard that the Office of Alamance County's Sheriff had initially handled this investigation rather than the NC Highway Patrol. Other oft-cited assertions remain up in the air. These include an understanding which prevailed among the participants in Tuesday's demonstration that the driver who struck Trejo is the son of a former state trooper. This particular claim seems to have been a source of some interest to Alamance County's District Attorney, Sean Boone. When contacted following his meeting on Tuesday, with the Highway Patrol's representatives, Boone acknowledged that he was still waiting to get some information before proceeding any further with his own investigation. He went on to make an oblique admission about one outstanding item when the Alamance News asked him directly about the rumors of Brown's familial relationship with a former state trooper. If you find that out, he said, let me know. 
The second article came out later that day from the district attorney with the same news outlet. Local court and law enforcement and officials are trying to deal with a whirlwind of misinformation surrounding the hit-and-run death of Daniela Trejo Mendiola, 17, which occurred on the night of August 20th in southern Alamance County. District Attorney Sean Boone tried to address some of the most notable aspects of misinformation that have been stirred up about the accident, largely on social media, in an exclusive interview with the Alamance News on Thursday, after the print edition of the newspaper had already been printed and distributed. Thursday's edition of the newspaper has reported the arrest of Joshua Thomas Brown, 38, white, male, 8963B Pleasant Hill Church Road, Liberty, who was charged on Wednesday with felony hit and run causing serious bodily injury or death. An additional infraction was added for a window tint violation. In the intervening two weeks, between the fatal accident and formal charges, more than a dozen or so demonstrators took to Court Square in Graham prior to Brown's arrest with signs and banners, protesting the absence of charges in the teenage girl's death. Among the most serious accusations made by some of the protesters and on social media has been that the highway patrol was showing favoritism or involved in a cover-up in not issuing charges, ostensibly because Brown was the son of a former or retired highway patrolman. In fact, according to Boone, we have found no relation of the driver to any person in law enforcement. Not the highway patrol, not the Alamance County Sheriff's Office, nor any other law enforcement agency. Some of the other egregious social media posts had misidentified the law enforcement agency that investigated the accident as being the Alamance County Sheriff's Office, rather than the Highway Patrol. The Sheriff's Office had no role in the investigation whatsoever, according to the department's public information officer, Byron Tucker. Tucker acknowledged that he and other officials, including the sheriff, have continued to receive calls and emails questioning the department's failure to file charges in the case, even though it wasn't their case in the first place. Another dimension of the swirl of social media misinformation has been an assertion or allegation that the driver was drunk and or had a history of drunk driving. D.A. Boone says his investigation has revealed there is no evidence the driver was impaired or had any history of previous episodes or arrests for driving while impaired. In fact, there is no evidence of speeding or any other moving violation, Boone says, based on information gathered by the Highway Patrol. Boone acknowledged that a history of impaired driving could have had an impact on the type of charges filed, but only if such a history existed, since a pattern of dangerous driving could have added the key element of malice, which might have substantiated a higher, more serious charge, such as second-degree manslaughter. Some of the girls' supporters have pressed for more serious charges, even after the hit-and-run charge was filed against Brown. It was a tragic accident, Boone concluded. The actions that resulted in criminal charges were due to Brown's actions after the collision, Boone stressed. During his interview with the newspaper, Boone read from the applicable North Carolina felony statute, NCGS 2166A, for a hit-and-run charge, stressing that it applies to a driver who is involved in a crash causing serious bodily injury or death. Other key elements are that the driver knows or reasonably should know that the vehicles is involved in a crash that has caused serious bodily injury or death fails to immediately stop at the scene of the crash, fails to remain with the vehicle at the scene until a law enforcement officer completes an investigation of the crash or authorizes the person to leave and the vehicle to be removed, facilitates, allows, or agrees to the removal of the vehicle before the completion of an investigation of the crash by a law enforcement officer or before receiving consent by the officer to leave. Boone would not confirm or comment on the sequence of events after the accident, but the Highway Patrol's warrant says after hitting something in the roadway, Brown then drove the vehicle to his parents' house, assessed the damages on the vehicle, and decided to get his parents to drive him back to the scene because the damage did not appear to be from a deer. Brown is said to have consented to having his cell phone downloaded, and there was no indication of apps being used, his texting, or doing anything else that might suggest he was distracted while driving. Brown's 2011 Volkswagen sedan shows damage to the front left side of the body and to the left side of the windshield. That damage suggested to investigators that the teen was struck near the center line of the road, Oak Grove Church Road, where the accident occurred. Boone said most of the evidence gathered by the highway patrol has been shared with the victim's family, but still rumors and misinformation continue to circulate, despite law enforcement's best efforts to provide a factual account of the circumstances of the accident and the girl's death.
as to why such misinformation continues to spread, Boone relayed two theories. Some well-meaning people repeating things without having all the facts, being the innocent interpretation. But he suggested another, more nefarious possibility, that others may have an agenda to stir things up, or may even hope to profit off of this. Before we wrap up, let's take a moment to understand the legal aspects surrounding this case. In North Carolina, hit and run incidents can be classified as felonies under certain conditions. If the accident causes injury, it is classified as a Class H felony. If it results in serious bodily injury or death, it escalates to a Class F felony. The criminal penalties for a hit and run depend on this classification. A misdemeanor carries a punishment of up to 120 days in jail and fines of up to $5,000. A Class H felony can result in 4 to 25 months in jail, suspension of the driver's license, and hefty fines. For a Class F felony, the penalties range from 10 to 41 months in jail, license suspension, and fines that can be as high as $20,000. Joshua was formally charged with a felony E on September 4th and was given a $50,000 bond, which is higher than the standard requirement. So, why are Betty and Olivia still involved in the protests? Let's delve into that. As you guys heard, Daniela's life does matter. She was taken off this earth senselessly without cause. She was sitting in a driveway when she was ran over by a man that was most likely on substances. It appears through rumor that he has association with law enforcement in this community. There is no evidence that Joshua was impaired at the time of the accident. The claim that he was manufacturing gummies is purely an allegation without solid facts to support it. While there are driving videos showing him speeding, there is no footage proving he was under the influence, contrary to some of the claims circulating online. Looking into Joshua's past offenses, June 2008, possession of marijuana, up to one tartu ounce, guilty, 12 months probation. April 2009, speeding 65 in a 45 zone, lesser disposition, improper speedometer court fee of $225. December 2010, failure to reduce speed, dismissed. But they shut the car down on Daniela. There's nothing wrong with this car. There's no, nothing. Why couldn't they have opened that? This just shows you the corruption in this town and how they're unwilling to help this young girl get justice. We understand that there are multiple crimes Moreover than what they charged this man with, he kicked his cell phone off the road. That is obstruction. That's tampering with evidence. Why is he still out here free? They gave him a $50,000 bond on a death of that beautiful girl right there. She deserves justice. What do we want? Justice. As of today, I am unsure when his next court appearance is scheduled. I urge social media creators to collaborate with law enforcement and the courts, recognizing that the legal process cannot always move at the pace demanded online. Everyone is entitled to a fair and unbiased court hearing or trial. Labeling every police unit or county as corrupt. To the attorney's office. Um, I am uh, going to read the charge levied against you, um, and I'll give you the maximum sentence as to that charge. Then I will hear from uh, the assistant district attorney, and he'll tell me about the allegations with that charge, if you have any criminal history, uh, if you're on probation or not, and whether or not you have any recent failure to appear. Okay. Uh, are you representing yourself in this matter? No, I'm hiring a lawyer. Okay. All right. Um, um, in, in this particular hearing, you're going you're gonna to speak for yourself. Okay, all right. So after the uh, assistant district attorney gets done speaking, then I'll allow you a moment. If that's what you want to do, you don't have to say anything again, okay? And then I'll make a ruling with regards to bond or, and, and so forth. Because it's my understanding that there is already a $50,000 bond uh, that, um, that's been made. Okay, all right. So uh, the charge against you is felony, hit and run, uh, with serious injury or death. That's a class F. Felony. 
punishable by a maximum sentence of 59 months in prison. Do you understand that? Okay. I will hear from uh, the district attorney. Yes, sir, uh, Your Honor. The allegations, it is alleged that on August 20th of this year, the defendant did commit the crime of felony hit and run with serious injury slash death. It is alleged that uh, he failed to remain on the scene unlawfully and willfully uh, failed to remain on that scene of a crash involving a, uh, uh, after law enforcement completed an investigation of that crash and authorized the defendant to leave. The crash occurred on Oak Grove Church Road and to make clear he left before that investigation was completed. And it did result in the death to Daniel Trejo uh, Mandela. The defendant uh, knew or should have known that the vehicle which the defendant was operating was involved in that crash and the crash uh, had resulted in serious bodily injury slash death. Uh, approximately on August, again on August 8th, uh, Trooper Lynch re responded to uh, that accident, to that wreck uh, that had, uh, in which the defendant allegedly struck the pedestrian. Uh, approximately 15 minutes later, uh, the defendant arrived back at the scene in a different vehicle in the passenger seat, and the when questioned, the defendant stated he thought he had hit a deer. Afterwards, he had then drove to his parents' house in snow camp, and the uh, driver assessed the damages and decided to get his parents to drive him back to the scene as the damages did not appear to be a deer. History wise, Your Honor. He was convicted of indecent liberties in 2010, uh, obstruction in 2022, and he has a pending. Uh, and he was convicted of driving while impaired in 2023 in Stanley County. He has a pending failure to report an accident out of Stanley County, unsealed wine passenger out of Stanley, and a pending DWLR repair out of Stanley. Um, again, um, Mr. Brown, you do not have to say anything, okay? Um, and that is your right. So if you don't want to say anything, just say so. That you don't want to say anything, and then I will, um, I'll make a ruling. Um, everything that he just said is false. Okay. I don't know who they have, but that's not wrong. With regards to the criminal history or yes, something? Yes, everything oh. they just say criminal okay. history-wise is not me. I don't know who they have brought up. I don't know who they have there, but that's not me. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to uh, issue the bond here. It's a, it, on, our, on this matter, um, it is 2B um, in that the nature of the charges the um, guideline amount is 30,000. Um, again, he was given a bond of 50,000. Uh, Your Honor, I do want to correct the record. It is not him. It's a different middle name. They do have the same birthday and the same everything else. So I do want to correct the record. He doesn't have no uh, record. I apologize. I do not know how it can be that close. So he has no record? Yes, he has no record. I want to be clear. He has no record. 
It is that close. Okay. Um, again, the, the guideline amount is thirty thousand. Um, you were given a fifty thousand dollar bond. I think um, going beyond the guideline amount is appropriate in this matter, uh, given the fact that um, that there was an actual hit and uh, impact with an individual. Uh, the fact that, you, that I've heard that you came back fifteen minutes later, uh, and also uh, the fact you came back fifteen minutes later in a different car. Um, so given those facts, uh, I am going to keep the bond the same at $50,000 because it's greater than the guideline amount. Um, so I'm going to ask you um, as a condition of your bond that, that you're not to assault, threaten, or harass uh, the family of the alleged, of the alleged victim, okay? uh, to obey all the laws of the land. Um, if you uh, do not have a driver's license, do not drive, um, and um, there's no need to have a curfew or anything of that nature at this point. Okay, so the bond will remain the same at fifty thousand dollars. When when is this next court date? His next court date, Your Honor, will be September twenty seventh in A. Okay, so please have your attorney uh, paid for and ready to go on September twenty seventh, courtroom A. All right, you're okay. All right, sir. Okay. When they are not meeting our immediate needs, may garner more views, but it does little to support the families enduring this tragedy. Standing outside yelling at a building does not aid the case. The law clearly outlines the penalties, and currently, Joshua is facing more time and a larger fine than what is typically allowed by law. Understandably, Daniela's family seeks justice and needs to feel heard, but having people yell that the police are corrupt does not help. Accusations are being made without any substantial proof, and that does not equate to justice for anyone involved. It's essential to remember that the legal system is designed to ensure fairness and due process for everyone. While emotions are understandably high, especially for Daniela's family, respecting the judicial process is crucial in achieving true justice. Let's focus on supporting the family and ensuring that the truth emerges through proper channels. Spreading unverified information and making unfounded accusations only hinders the pursuit of justice and prolongs the family's pain. Until next time, stay safe.